We've, we're in the second part, two series, the last week of, of our second series called Growing Pains. Acts is the story of the birth of the church and its growth. Before we get into tonight's or the message, I want to ask a question. How many of you know what an oxymoron is? So you, oh, you learned it in school. Right. So, uh, of course, an oxymoron is uh, two seemingly contradictory words that are placed together, a figure of speech in which two words that appear contradictory are put together. Like, uh, give me some examples. Would you like an example? Go ahead. Pretty ugly. Pretty ugly. That's good. Yeah, I thought of that one. Yep. Bears football? Is that an oxymoron? <laughs> right, this year, maybe. I'm a Bears fan, but I have to admit, right? Jumbo shrimp, civil war, open secret, right? These are oxymorons. And by the way, you may not have known this. The word itself, oxymoron, comes from two Greek words, oxy and moros. Moros meaning dull, oxy meaning sharp. The word itself is what it means. It is an oxymoron, which is pretty interesting. Today we look at an oxymoron that comes right out of the, the, the book of Acts. The blessing of persecution. The blessing of persecution. How could persecution be a blessing? As I said, this is a year-long study, and we're in the, second, the end of a second series called Growing Pains. And we're looking at, the first series was Reaching the World, the explosive birth and growth of the church. It was an unstoppable force. The Holy Spirit came on the apostles in Jerusalem. They were preaching the word. People are being converted by the thousands of miraculous healings. The, they're just, they can't be stopped. And then we see they have some difficulties, both internal corruption and struggle and pain and external opposition from the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council. And we finish up that part of the series now today. Chapter 7 ends with the martyrdom of a man named Stephen. Pastor Brian preached on this a couple of weeks ago, or Pastor Sterling, I forget which one was here, but talked about how Stephen was stoned to death for giving the gospel to the Sanhedrin, presenting Jesus as the Christ. Let's read together, and, I'll read on, and you can follow along on the screens, from Acts 7, verse 58, through Acts 8, verse 8. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. This is a pretty amazing story. Uh, the first observation I want to make and talk through for a, a bit here is uh, the church is scattered, but God is sovereign. That's the theme, if you want, for this whole text. The church is scattered, but God is sovereign. You may not know this about our church, but FBCG actually was born out of some opposition, some difficulty, even you might say persecution. Uh, in 1894, seven Swedish immigrant families who lived in Batavia no longer wanted to make the horse and buggy ride to the first Swedish Baptist church uh, of Batavia, and so they decided to plant one near their home here in Geneva. And that's how we got started. In fact, it wasn't until 1933 that they stopped having Swedish spoken in services. Um, this the first Swedish Baptist church of Geneva was actually a plant. But that first church in Batavia was actually started by immig Swedish immigrants who came over from Sweden because they were under oppression and persecution from the state church in Sweden, which prevented them from reading the Bible in their common language and from observing, uh, presenting the gospel the way they felt the, the Bible instructed them to. They wanted religious freedom. They're willing to leave their homeland and come here to do that planted a church in Batavia, and we are a plant from that church. It's amazing to think about that when we talk about growing to serve and where we are. Let's summarize the opposition so far uh, for, in the book of Acts. In, in chapter 4, Peter and John heal a beggar, and they're arrested for preaching in the name of Jesus. And they're warned to stop preaching in the name. And they say, we can't help it. And so the Sanhedrin warns them and lets them go. Chapter 5, they're arrested again. This time they're beaten, they're scourged, 40 lashes minus 1. 
and they're released. And they celebrate the fact that they're worthy to suffer like Jesus suffered, and they pray for more boldness. These are not your average suburban American Christians. In chapter 7, Stephen's arrested, and he's put on trial before the Sanhedrin, and he gives this long, amazing gospel presentation, beginning with, with, with Abraham and Moses, and right on through. And at the end of it, the Sanhedrin stirs up the crowd, and they stone Stephen to death. He's the first Christian martyr. Now, at this point of the story, we get our first introduction to a guy named Saul of Tarsus. He's mentioned here in Acts chapter 7. And again in Acts chapter 8, Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul, who will write over half of the New Testament, at this stage of the story is a very different guy. Some of you know he was um, of Tarsus. Tarsus is in Cilicia. That's the southeastern corner of modern-day Turkey, born around somewhere between 2 and 4 AD. He's... um, Uh, Born into a devout Jewish family, he becomes a Pharisee. Whether his parents were or not, we don't know. A Pharisee was an extreme Jewish nationalist and radically committed to the keeping of the law of Moses. And in fact, he gets the best education of the day because he goes to Greek schools. And then he's sent to Jerusalem to study under a guy named Gamaliel, probably the most respected rabbi in the first century in and around Jerusalem. In fact, you might remember in chapter 5, we heard about this guy Gamaliel. We'll get to him a little bit later on. So he's got the best education of the day. And he's a radical zealot, an extremist, if you will, a Jew. Saul is standing by giving his approval. The the implication of the text is there that he ordered this execution, that he was behind it all. They lay the garments of Stephen at his feet. The implication is he was the ringleader. He was stirring this up. And in Acts 3, Luke tells, in Acts 8, 3, excuse me, Luke tells us that Saul begins to ravage the church. The word ravage is an interesting word in English. In Greek, it's the word um, havoc, uh, like wreaking havoc. It still doesn't quite have the connotation in our language that it, that it has in ancient Greek. It was most frequently used in ancient literature to describe a wild boar or lion tearing its prey apart limb from limb. That's the word. He's wreaking unbelievable havoc on Christians and on the church, like a wild animal ravaging the church tearing it apart, quite literally. That's what Saul's up to. The point is he raged against the Christians like a wild animal. House to house, we're told. Dragging them off physically to put in prison. Almost reads like the Nazis emptying out the ghettos, going house to house, searching everywhere for whoever they could find. At the time, the Sanhedrin, that's who he had them on trial before, and that's who had them arrested. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, kind of like our Congress and Supreme Court all rolled into one, the highest authority in Jerusalem, save only the Roman authorities, did not have the legal right to put anyone to death. They coerced Pilate into crucifying Jesus, but they could not themselves execute someone. What they could do was scourge them. Forty lashes minus one, 39 lashes. This is severe punishment. That's what Saul's doing to Christians. Now remember, where the story's gone, 120 believers, about the the size of this room, in the world, the Spirit descends on them in Acts chapter 2. They preach the gospel. People are converted. They hear the gospel that God loves them, that Christ died for them. They come, their hearts are transformed, and this thing is growing. And as it grows, it faces opposition. And the opposition culminates in the stoning of a man named Stephen. And Saul takes that moment to go on the rampage. The whole thing begins to take a different turn now. And this kind of religious persecution, it seems almost unthinkable in our culture, in our day. But it happens in many parts of the world. We see almost weekly new atrocities committed by a group called ISIS or the Islamic State. Torture, beheadings. Many of those victims are Christians. Pastor Brian and Pastor Bruce returned recently from Dubai where they met some Muslims who had converted to Christianity and told them, you've heard some of these stories, and I'm sure you'll hear more, where they can't go home. In fact, part of, part of their conversion experience is to find a new place to live because they will be killed if they go home to devout Muslim families. Verse 1 in chapter 8 says, And on that day, and on that day, there arose this persecution. That day is an emphatic statement in the Greek text. It means there's a new, something new is happening here. Something that hadn't before happened is now happening. A turning point. 
Luke's telling us that the stoning of Stephen sparked the beginning of an extremely violent period of persecution against Christians living in the city of Jerusalem. That's the epicenter. That's the only place Christianity in the church was located was in the city of Jerusalem at this time in the world history. The threat of imprisonment, violence, death was so great that many of the Christians, in fact all except for the, the apostles, fled. They left the city. Things were getting too heated into the surrounding regions of Judea and Samaria. I hope you caught that. The church is scattered to surrounding regions of Judea and Samaria. I want you to turn back in your Bibles, if you have them, to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is the great, this is the mandate, the mission that Jesus gave us and the first Christians. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in where? Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jerusalem, they're already there. Judea and Samaria, the end of the earth. Now, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Interesting, by the way, that you just flip those numbers around, isn't it? Acts 1, 8 says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where they are. Judea and Samaria. They haven't gone there yet. Acts 8, verse 1. Can we go there? And there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? That in the text, Luke uses the word for scattering, a Greek word called diaspora. Uh, it's, he could have used, it, it, literally, it literally meant sowing throughout, scattering, like scattering seed, sowing seed. There are other Greek words he could have used, like disintegrated, disappeared entirely, run away like a defeated army. He didn't use those words. He used a word for scattering that meant scattering seed. Not like they're defeated. Well, they may have thought that but like they're being scattered for a purpose. Back to Acts 1, verse 8. Are you beginning to grasp what's happening here? The church is scattered under violent, terrible persecution, but God is sovereign over it all. What looks like the end is not the end. It's a beginning. I'm going to talk about this for just a minute. Saul was doing everything in his power to undo this movement called the church, to eradicate Christians from the face of the earth. By any practical measure in today's world, this movement called the church should have been over. This should have been the last time any of us ever heard about Christ followers in world history. They killed their leader, Jesus. That didn't stop them. They killed this guy, Stephen. They're dragging him off out, of the, out in the streets to stand trial, beating them severely. They all scatter. It should be over. It should be the end of it. But it's not. But you're here, and I'm here, so it's not the end. Let me take you back to Acts chapter 5, verses 38 to 39. It's not on the screens. You can turn your Bibles if you have them, or in your Acts journals. This is the account of their first, when they stand trial for the second time before the Sanhedrin. That's Peter and John. And when they're on trial, one of the Pharisees, a man named Gamaliel, who was the teacher of Saul, remember, stands up and he says, uh, in verse uh, 38, Verse 37, after him, Judas the Galilean, he rose up and he said, so in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or if this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even find yourself opposing God. He's right. They were not able to overthrow them. They do find themselves opposing God. For all their efforts, this is not the end of the story. It is from God. And I think there's an important lesson for us here. Not just here in Acts, but throughout the Bible and really the heart of the gospel is this message. When things look darkest, it is when God does his best work. When things look worst, it is when we most cling to hope. Isn't that the, the heart of the gospel message? Isn't that the cross? I mean, what looked darker than Good Friday? The cross, the death of God. The enemies of God had won, so they thought. God took that darkness and turned it into the glorious light of Resurrection Sunday. That's the heart of the message. When things look like it's over and there's no hope, and where is God, then he shows up in a way we can't even imagine. A way we rarely see even at the time. 
in his sovereignty, God can use the persecution and scattering to accomplish his purposes. He delights in turning darkness into light and turning pain into, into rejoicing and taking mourning into dancing and taking despair and turning it into hope. J.R.R. Tolkien, who many of you know as the author of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, he was a good friend of C.S. Lewis's, some of you might know that. They were in a group called the Inklings together. And they wrote uh, often about the, the importance of fairy stories and myths and poems. And Tolkien coined a phrase called you catastrophe. If you take off the EU, catastrophe is like the sudden, terrible, unexpected disaster. It's a catastrophe, right? He says you, meaning good, the you catastrophe, the you prefix EU, good, like you Evangelion, good news. He says this you catastrophe is the sudden, unexpected, happy turn for the good in a story which pierces you with joy that brings tears. Isn't that a great line? He says the best stories, when things look darkest, there's this turn that we don't see coming, and it's joyful, and it's good, and it's redemptive, and it moves us. That's pointing us to the gospel. That's what's happening here at Acts. This violent persecution, this scattering, what should be the end of it all, is not the end. There's something surprising and marvelous happening here that even those who are running for their lives don't even see. Later on, uh, Tolkien writes this. It's a sudden and miraculous grace in the Christian story. Joy beyond the walls of this world, poignant as grief and far more powerful. That's the catastrophe. That's what he's talking about here. That's what's happening. It's the very heart of the gospel. So notice here that Luke mentions that everyone is scattered except the apostles. If you go back to the text for a minute with me in verse 1, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Why does he say that? Remember, Luke's a physician. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. He's a doctor. He's an exact man. He's into details. He gives them to us for a reason. He says they're all scattered except the apostles. Why include that detail? Why do the apostles stay in Jerusalem? Perhaps it's because they're not afraid of dying. Perhaps that's true. I think it's because they had already given their lives preparing those who were scattered to go and be his witnesses. Remember in Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching. What were they teaching? They're teaching Jesus. They'd been devoted to this teaching, and now they're ready. They don't even know it yet, but they're ready because they're being scattered. What if they never left Jerusalem? Think about that. I was thinking about this just this week when I was reading over the text and thinking about the sermon. It occurred to me, what if they never left? What if the persecution never came? What if they just stayed there? Now, this is so good. We're with, the, we're with the, the apostles, the eyewitnesses. We get to meet in our homes and the temple courts, and we've got, it's going great for us. Let's just stay right here and do this church thing. What would have happened if they never left Jerusalem? It's highly unlikely we'd be here. It would have stayed there. But what was God's command to them? What was the mandate? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, but not just there, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's, I, I'm speculating here, but it's possible they got a little comfortable. Evangelism was happening pretty easy in Jerusalem. People are coming in by the hundreds and thousands. We're seeing God's miraculous hand. This thing is going great. Sure, we had a little trouble here and there, but it's, for the most part, we're succeeding. God's saying, it's time for you to get out of the nest. Go, go. Now, I'm not saying God caused the death of Stephen or he caused the persecution. I think that's evil. I think that's against what God would want. It's an evil in the world. However, God redeemed it. In his sovereignty, he used it for his purpose. I admit that we're touching there on a mystery which is hard for our human minds to understand. But God can take... Remember the story of Joseph? Joseph? When his brothers sold him into slavery, and they meet up years later. Remember the story in Genesis? And what does Joseph, they're afraid he's going to kill him. And what does Joseph say to them? What you intended for evil, God meant for good. What you did out of the sinfulness of your heart, God redeemed in my life. I think that's what's happening here. To carry on this mission. The movement has to go. You know, you know whatever you watch, just as a little aside, which is not in the notes, and that always gets dangerous. But if you ever watch like apocalyptic movies, right? Movies about the end of the world. Who likes those movies? 
And usually there's zombies involved. We're all going to catch some virus and turn into zombies or something like this. I don't know. Well, that's the big thing now. And so anyway, what, what always happens in every one of those movies, there's, when it's before the, the, the epidemic has spread, there's always a bunch of like uh, generals and government officials and some scientists. They're all in a room with a big screen. And eventually a map comes up on the screen and there's a dot on the map. And they say, this is ground zero, right? This is the epicenter. We're, we're here. And, it's like it, and then they, they show like the time lapse, like in 12 hours, this is what it's going to look like. Oh, the, you know, the red is spreading or whatever. In 36 hours, in 72 hours, in two months, and then pretty soon the whole world is zombies, right? Except for those who have prepped for such an occasion and they're living underground, but that's another thing. Anyway, in a way, it's an epi- they're talking about an epidemic spreading, right? In a way, this is like the good epidemic. Jerusalem is ground zero. It's the epicenter of what God's been doing. And it's about to explode. It's about to go out into the Roman world and transform the world. It's about to just start, you know, and they, they don't have any idea. And God uses this, this dark hour to do a miraculous work. This brings us to the, where the gospel goes, there is salvation and joy. Where the gospel goes, there is salvation and joy. You know, back to that idea of not leaving Jerusalem. Historically speaking, prosperity has been far more dangerous for God's people than persecution. Historically speaking, comfort, ease, prosperity has been far more damaging to the church than persecution has. And I speak that, and you hear that in the midst of a culture in which we are prosperous. You might not feel prosperous comparing yourself to your neighbor or your brother-in-law or whoever else. But in the world's economy, you're the haves, the rich. We're the prosperous. We're the comfortable. We're those who live lives of ease. We live in a culture which is far more dangerous to what God wants to do in us and in the church than it is in a place where people are physically persecuted for their faith. That's hard for me to get my mind around. But it's true, historically speaking. Prosperity is one of, I think, our enemy's biggest weapons to make us feel, just stay where you are. Stay comfortable. Things are good. Don't take that many risks. Don't get crazy about this this Christianity thing. I mean, a little religion is good for people, but let's not go nuts here. Let's keep it in its place. That's damaging to our souls and to what God wants to do in the world. But wherever there's been persecution and hardship, God's people seem to flourish. It's happening that way still today. In fact, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, secular sociologist Rodney Stark wrote this book. I, I recommend it to you if you want to pick up a secular historian and sociologist examination of how did this little thing called Christianity succeed in the world. He writes this. He says, um, the fact is that typically people in the ancient world and in the modern one do not go out seeking a new faith. They encounter one through their ties to other people who already hold this faith. It's not never, but in general, people are not out looking for a new faith. What happens to them is they encounter somebody who has this faith, and it's attractive It's curious, it's compelling, and they want to know about it. That's what God is doing, taking these Christians with this compelling thing called the gospel that's changed their life and saying, all right, you're going now. I'm going to put you next to other people. You're going to encounter other people. That's precisely what happens here. Notice here that Philip goes to the region of Samaria. That's verse 5 of Acts chapter 8. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, Philip, where we've heard about him in Acts chapter 6. Remember back to Acts 6 when there was this issue in the church? The Greek-speaking widows were saying, you're overlooking us in the distribution of food. So there were seven men appointed to help with this issue, this problem, deacons or servants of the church. Philip's one of them. We don't know about him before that. So the first time we hear about Philip is Acts 6, and he is at that stage a man who's appointed to help with food distribution to widows. Now, here in Acts 8, he's boldly proclaiming the gospel in Samaria. Why is Samaria interesting? Well, Jesus said we'd go there. But additionally, it's no secret that Jews and Samaritans hated each other. 
It would be, Martin Lloyd-Jones in his commentary on this, this book, he says, it would be hard to overstate in our culture the ethic, ethnic tension and racial animosity between Jews and Samaritans. Go back and read 2 Kings 17 if you want to, and you'll see the kind of the history of this, the perversion of the Jewish faith, so the Jews thought, intermarriage with Assyrians, and for centuries now, they hate each other. They even had a separate temple, a separate form of worship. They were sort of like half-breeds and impure to the Jews. And the Samaritans hated the Jews right back. This is, in fact, if you, Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 9, Peter and John and, and James talk to Jesus as if God's going to burn up Samaria and all the Samaritans in it with his judgment. Now Philip, a disciple of Christ, goes there to preach the gospel. What does that tell you? That something's happened in Philip's heart. Something's changed in him that he would go there. And he preaches the gospel. And the gospel has de is destroying the barriers that divided Jew and Samaritan. In fact, look at verse 8 of, of, of Acts chapter 8. How does this little story end? So there was much joy in that city. Really? Joy in Samaria because a Jew who believed in Jesus showed up there because he's running for his life and talked about the love of Christ? Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? what God is doing through this seemingly dark hour. Chapter 8 begins with Saul ravaging the church. It begins with persecution. It ends with proclamation and joy. We're, we are now the scattered ones. You think about that? You and I, those of us who believe in and follow Jesus with our lives, not perfectly but the best we can, we are the scattered ones. We're the descendants of those who were dispersed, scattered, scattered. We carry on that very mission in the world. Had the church not been forced out of Jerusalem, it's unlikely we'd have that mission. But we do. In fact, I want to talk to you just briefly about what that means for us, practically speaking. What does it mean? This is, is this historically interesting? Okay, we ought to, we, you know, this is where we come from? Or what does it mean for us today? How do we impact, reach, encounter people with the love of Christ today? And let's be honest, it's not always, I mean, when, you, when I stand up here in the pulpit to preach God's truth, that's one thing. But what about when you're in Target, or you your, your kid's ball game, or your next other parents at a meeting was for school? How do you connect with them and share the love of Christ in those contexts? What about your neighbors? How does it work there? Pastor Sterling, our high school pastor, shared a story with Pastor Brian and I recently about a young man named Jake in Trek, the high school ministry. So Jake's kind of a regular kid. And he was, Jake actually sent in this little clip that we have permission to share, his story about how he reached out to his friend. He said, I've got a group of friends, and we all hang out, and one day we're playing Xbox. Most of them, sounds like my children, most of them don't believe in God, so they're messing with me and teasing me and making fun of me for believing in God. So I was talking to Sam, apparently his friend, and everyone else later that night. The topic of God came up again. This time I was the only Christian in the whole conversation. And after an hour or so, Sam admitted that he'd never been to church, never tr really had any interest in believing in God. I told him if he would come to my church with me for one month straight, and he'd, I would never bother him again if he didn't like it. He said he would come. He has, and he's not stopped coming, and he loves it. And he loves Jesus. How, awful, how awesome is that? This kid Jake's playing Xbox with his friends, and they're teasing him. They say, okay, fine, you come with me for a month, we'll make a deal. And the guy says yes, and he does. And his life's been changed. I know what it's like. I've got neighbors. And I see them and I wave. And I drive in my, my, my garage and I go into my house, sit in front of my TV, talk to my kids, get in my car, drive, open the garage door automatically, drive away. We wave when we see each other and we pull the garbage cans out. Or when it gets warm, like 100 months from now. <laughs> we don't interact, right? Those are, they live right next door to me. You've got them too. Parents that you see all the time at your kids' functions people that you encounter. What, what does it really look like then? Do you run around with a giant Bible, preaching the end is near? Do you wear a sandwich board on the corner of Fargo and Randall? And, no, well, how does it work? How do you do it? I want to give you three simple steps, three simple things that you can start implementing. The first thing, it's going to sound, it's going to sound so simple you might be able to, you might miss, gloss over it, is to pray. Start praying for the people in your life. And start praying for God to give you opportunities to talk about Jesus. Just start there. If you did nothing else, that would be wonderful. 
Just pray for those that you know who don't know Jesus. Pray for their heart. Pray for their lives. Pray for an opportunity at some point down the road for you to share what's in your heart. Number two is engage. Engage with them. Don't just pull in your, in your garage. Walk over. We have neighbors that moved in down the street, and, you know, we're busy people, but we walk over, and, and they just moved in because the family just moved away. I think I told the story a couple of months ago that these family that had lived next to me for 15 years, I hardly knew them. They moved away when they retired, and I thought, I'm not making the mistake when the next people move in. <laughs> and they're not here yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll drag them up here when they are. No. But we walked over. We just got to know them. My daughter now babysits for their kids. We're starting to get to know them, get to know their lives. I'm not saying we're we're like shoving Christ down their throat, but we're taking an interest in who they are, what goes on in their life. Engage with them. Maybe there's an opportunity to serve them. Maybe there's an opportunity to encourage them. Maybe there's a question that will come up. So pray and engage. And the third thing, when when the time is right, when God gives you an opportunity, is to invite. Maybe it's invite them to a conversation. Maybe it's invite them to church. Maybe it's invite them to a function. Here, maybe, uh, some kind of invitation into your faith. I think the, one of the great um, little, little deceits of our enemy is to build up in our minds, what if? What if they don't like me? What if they think I'm crazy? What if they, it gets weird? What if it's awkward? And all these what ifs. You know how many people are wide open to hearing the message of Christ's love for them? And we're a little bit too busy, a little bit too nervous, a little bit too scared, a little bit too comfortable to even care. So if we do nothing else, let's make a covenant together that those of us who love Jesus will start praying for the people in our lives who don't. We'll start looking for opportunities to engage them about their own lives. And then when God gives us the opportunity, we will step forward and talk to them about it, invite them. You have no idea what God would do. You know, in the text when it says they went into into these regions of Judea and Samaria preaching the good news. Most scholars, they interpret that not to be like pulpit preaching, or street corner preaching. They're talking about simply sharing, proclaiming with their lives the love of Christ. I believe that's what God wants with us and for us because the dispersion, the scattering, the movement hasn't stopped. We're still a part of it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this amazing book called Acts and its incredible truths. We know that you've told us your word is living and active. And we want to play the part that you've called us to play in this grand story, with grace and courage and truth. Forgive us for shrinking back, for being too distracted and too busy. Open our eyes and our hearts to those around us who you want us to engage. We pray this in your name and for your sake, Lord Jesus. Amen.